off. Hi, everyone. Hi, all the attendees. Welcome to our celebration of 100 years of women in law, breaking barriers, shaping history. We're so excited for the evening ahead. Uh, and we're so excited to have all these amazing women here with us, spending the next hour and a half with us to have this important conversation. First things first, though, the Alumni Network for Harvard Women, or ANHW, as I will often refer to it now throughout this sort of conversation, is part of the larger Harvard Alumni Association and is a shared interest group for the women alumni of all Harvard schools. Our aim at ANHW is to advance the value of women's leadership and success across the globe and strengthen the voices of women. This event is hosted by the India and Pakistan chapters in our first ever event together. Well, uh, India and Pakistan might be on the opposite sides of the field in the cricket matches, which I believe there's one happening as we speak, but we will always be on the same side when it comes to the advancement of women and women in law. Now, sort of before we go any further, I wanted to share uh, one patch of unfortunate news. A short while back, we received word from Menika that there's been an emergency on her end, due to which she's not able to join the event. However, we're immensely fortunate to have an amazing set of speakers join the conversation. And we know that this discussion is going to be all the richer for their invaluable insights and diverse perspectives. I'm now, now going to come to the introduction of all these amazing women that are in front of you right now. Introducing Nandini Khetan. Nandini is a partner in the dispute resolution team of Khetan & Co., one of India's largest and leading law firms. She's currently based in Calcutta, and her practice, primarily commercial law, extends from Calcutta High Court to Supreme Court of India in Delhi, and from the Bombay High Court to arbitration and other tribunals. Nandini has an LLM from Columbia Law School and was named in the 40 under 40 list by Economic Times in 2020. Next up, we have uh, Maria, who is a partner in Access Law Papers, one of Pakistan's leading law firms, um, involved in international commercial arbitration, project finance, and transactional and corporate advisory work. Uh, Maria has been recommended by Legal 500 and Chambers and Partners. Maya also appeared in the High Court of Pakistan. She has served as an assistant advocate general for the province of Punjab and is a visiting faculty member at Sheikh Ahmed Hassan School of Law. Also has various national and international publications to her name. Maya holds an LLM from the London School of Economics. Now coming to Ankita. Ankita is a counsel at the Bombay High Court with an extremely busy commercial practice of a wide range of laws, which she practices in the Bombay High Court, the National Company Law Tribunal, various big ticket arbitration proceedings and other tribunals. Ankita started her career from the chambers of senior counsel Janak Dwarkadas, undoubtedly one of Bombay's and India's top commercial counsels. And now she has an independent chamber. Ankita also has a bachelor's in civil law BCL from Oxford University and has acted as arbitrator in many commercial disputes. Uh, Shayan? Is she frozen? Yeah, it appears so. All right. So, so I'm going to do Mavish's introduction Please. instead. Oh, okay. Shan, you're back. Sorry, was there an issue? Yeah, am I, am I? yeah you were frozen, but go ahead with Mavish's introduction. Okay. okay, thank you. So I'll just begin again. Mavish is the company secretary and general counsel at HBL Microfinance Bank. Um, she's the youngest member of their senior management. She's um, a recipient of Pakistan's first Women in Law Awards uh, 2020 to 2021 for the category of in-house legal counsel. She holds an LLM from the University of Cambridge, uh, where she was uh, a recipient of the Cambridge Commonwealth Trust Award and the Noon Educational Foundation Award, and was presented as a Cambridge Pegasus Scholar. Uh, Mevish has been involved in various initiatives invo involving women empowerment as well. And so that's all the amazing women that we have uh, in front of us today. But now coming to the moderators, that's Cheyenne and me, and introducing us. Um, Cheyenne, yeah, do you want I'll to start off? I'll start off. Yeah, yeah, I'll start off with you. Uh, so Mehti is a counsel at the Bombay High Court. 
uh, practicing commercial disputes for uh, from the chambers of Zal. Uh, and, and sorry, I, I don't want to mispronounce this. Um, Andhya Rujina, senior advocate, Bombay High Court and door tenant, Fountain Court. Maitri has an LM from Harvard Law School and was a gold medalist and valedictorian at Mumbai University, where she completed her LLB studies. Uh, Maitri is dual qualified in India and New York. Uh, she's the co-president of the Alumni Network for Harvard Women in India. Um, and in her free time, she is building her forum, a platform for women in law. Thanks, Shayan, for that very kind introduction. Introducing Shayan, Shayan's a barrister of England and Wales and an advocate of the High Courts of Pakistan with over 10 years of experience in commercial and dispute work in Pakistan and Singapore. Shayan had the privilege of being a law clerk to the Chief Justice of Pakistan. She's practiced law at a reputable law firm based in Islamabad and then became associate partner under the age of 30. Shayan started her independent legal practice and was awarded the Women in Law Sole Practitioner of the Year Award in 2021. Last year, she moved to Singapore to work as legal counsel at Amazon and now is currently a legal counsel at Riot Games in Singapore. Cheyenne has also read law at the University of London and holds a Master's of Law from Harvard Law School. Thank you so much, Mithi. Before we kick off into the sort of the heated discussion and the, all the insights that you all have to share with us, we have a very special surprise for everyone who's on the call. And this is a video message from a very inspiring woman who shares a brief history about what we're celebrating to be today, how important the occasion is for us all, and that the journey that we're yet to traverse. This video message is from Justice B.V. Nagaratna. To introduce Justice Nagaratna is no mean task. Her achievement speaks for herself. She's a judge at the Supreme Court of India. Before her elevation to the Supreme Court of India, she was a judge of the Karnataka High Court. At the Supreme Court, Justice Nagaratna has delivered several key decisions. Her dissent in the demonetization judgment, regulation of sensationalist views and news, freedom of speech in regards to members of parliaments and members of legislative assemblies, and in matters involving right to education and access to education by all. She is known for her fairness, great temperament to both seniors and juniors, and compassion in cases which so require. And as a matter of great pride to all women and men in India, she's in line to become India's first female Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in 2027. So without further ado, and without keeping you all from her, I'm going to uh, broadcast her video. Just give me a second. Distinguished invitees, learned guest speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you all. I am delighted to be present virtually with you as we commemorate 100 years of women in law in the Indian subcontinent. I congratulate the Alumni I Network for Harvard Women for India and Pakistan respectively and all the members of the Alumni I Network for Harvard Women for organizing this webinar on the theme Celebrating 100 Years of Women in Law, Breaking Barriers, Shaping History. In the 19th century, a number of legal reforms were achieved towards women's equality project. Women were also gaining access to higher education. The time was ripe for the emergence of women lawyers as professional subjects. India, a newspaper published by the Indian News Agency reported on September 1st, 1916, and I quote, that the latest attempt on the part of a woman to break her birth's invidious bar and get within the defenses of a strictly guarded profession, unquote, was paid by Regina Guha who completed her MA in 1913 and a Bachelor of Laws degree in 1916 from Calcutta University. She submitted an application to be enrolled as a pleader in the court of District Judge Alipur. Since this was the first instance of an application by a lady for enrollment as a pleader, 
her application was heard by a special bench for judicial determination of the question whether the legal practitioners act contemplated women practitioners a bench of five judges heard her application and unanimously came to the conclusion that only men are entitled to be admitted as pleaders sir ashutosh bukerji presided over that bench however the allahabad high court took the radical step of allowing cornelia sorabji to be enrolled as a wakil the legal practitioners women act was finally passed in 1923 a hundred years ago removing the disqualification and affirming that no woman shall by reason only of her sex be disqualified from being admitted or enrolled as a legal practitioner or from practicing as such on this occasion i gratefully remember and pay tribute to women such as regina guha cornelia sorabji durga bai deshmukh and sudanshu bala hasra for attempting to uproot the double whammy faced by women who are oppressed not only by the colonial powers but also by the rigid patriarchy within the country while for the last 100 years women are not disqualified from practicing before a court of law we often find that the women enter or get into the legal profession but many don't get up the glass ceiling implies the existence of an impermeable barrier that blocks the vertical mobility of women it is important to look at three main phenomena in this context one the entry of women into the legal profession two the retention of women and growth of their numbers in the profession and three the advancement of women in numbers to senior echelons of the profession their upward mobility is hampered by systemic discrimination the judiciary at every level is required to be sensitive independent and free from biases inclusion of women in the judiciary would also ensure that the decision making process is more responsive inclusive and participatory at all levels the basic arguments put forward for justifying how women judges make a difference can be summarized as follows it gives a voice to the section of that society which for a very long time has remained under subjugation by providing an equal platform to voice her experiences and observations advancing women's greater participation in the women plays a role in the judiciary plays a role in promoting gender equality in broader ways women's a visibility as judicial officers can pave the way for women's greater representation in other decision making positions such as the legislature and executive branches of government how should female lawyers confront the reality of the glass ceiling and chisel away at it until they can break through to the other side how do women confront the motherhood dilemma first women lawyers must set actionable goals and define to whatever extent practicable their career trajectory second mentors are reported to help women lawyers navigate through the landscape of the legal profession third it is important to be patient but not complacent every member of the legal fraternity has a role to play towards the three pronged objective of entry retention and of advancement of women in the legal profession on that note i once again congratulate the alumni i network for harvard women for hosting this webinar to commemorate the 100th year of women in the legal profession in the subcontinent i hope that the discussion to follow would be able to set the tone for discourse on empowerment of women within the legal profession thank you and namaskar
So on that note, with those very inspirational words, we can now start this discussion. So my first question is actually going to be directed at uh, Ankita first. I think um, your sort of experiences are very helpful in understanding exactly um, how women can navigate the culture in courts and in the legal fraternity. The question is this, that in the legal fraternity and in courts particularly, there's some things that are less visible, lack of women in certain types of matters, lack of senior counsel who are women, lesser number of women judges, and then there are sort of more obvious things, infrastructurally, um, lesser bathrooms for women, harassment incidents in lower courts, gender profiling, comments sometimes from male colleagues, essentially sort of pointing to the fact that courts and the legal fraternity has never really been uh, gender equal or gender neutral. How do you navigate this culture? How do you navigate it by retaining your unique perspective as a woman? Or do you adapt and modify your uniqueness in a world that's more male dominated, the way you speak, the way you dress? That's question number one. And question number two, that's sort of very connected is how does one rise above all these sort of systemic issues that even Justice Nagaratna pointed? Uh, do you rise by acknowledging it or fighting it? Or do you rise by sort of turning a blind eye to it? Um, so, Methali, it's uh, a question which uh, is a part of everyday existence in the courts in India, uh, as you are also aware. Any woman practitioner who starts out in council practice in India uh, definitely faces these issues, whether from the from the very beginning of her career or at a mid level point where she's on the brink of crossing over to seniority. I I don't know if there is a right or wrong way or a or I would go so far as prescribing a particular way in which to deal with it. What, what I can do is share my personal experience on how I navigated it and how I saw some of the very, very few, and in that sense, Phoenix women who are there at the bar navigating this. So there's definitely a sense of being not the first grade citizen in court. Uh, as a woman counsel. Having said that, I personally found that if you don't treat that as a disability, or if you don't become overtly aware of the fact to a point that it becomes a disability in your demeanor, in your interaction with solicitors, attorneys, in your appearances, uh, in the way that you approach matters, it tends to lessen the the consciousness of a disability. There is a disability. There's no running away from that fact. But the point is whether you choose to treat yourself in that fashion. That is the first. Uh, that is the first thing which I found very empowering because it's it's entirely self uh, generated. That you don't need anybody else's assistance to do that. The second aspect, of course, is that you have to treat yourself as a part of the room. Now, of course, very often you find yourself as the only woman in court or the only woman in an arbitration where around the people, 35 others are all men. Uh, and to me, that consciousness doesn't come because you're so focused on ensuring that you're ready with the matter. You're, you have the points on the top of your head. You're able to communicate it. The consciousness of being different from everybody else in the room perhaps comes in the way maybe an arbitrator or your opponent or sometimes uh, a judge may address you, not by your name or as madam. Uh, that's when it hits you that, oh, uh, I, I, I'm standing in the second row and not in the first row with everybody else. Once again, it I found the best way to deal with it is to not acknowledge it as either a slight or a difference, but just forge ahead, continue to uh, argue your matter, present your point of view in the way that you had planned. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting for a minute that any of this is easy or comes to you on day one. It does not. What does come to you on day one and many days thereafter is the shock of being treated differently, uh, especially when 
you see the world around you that is the world of law firms or the world of gcs where women are at least in the indian subcontinent and definitely abroad at par with their male colleagues and oftentimes outnumber their male colleagues in all these organizations uh having said that the only thing that i have found to help me is the practice of ignoring anybody's idea of treating you as a second grade lawyer or a second rank lawyer in court uh yes it is disheartening to not see so many women in a commercial litigation uh not so many designated seniors not as many judges as we like but having said that in our generation i draw great inspiration from some of the most fantastic women judges both uh, in the supreme court and in the bombay high court you know them a lot of people practicing in bombay know them uh, and they're doing such excellent work that and the fact that they're so few and far between they stand out all the more for the great work that they do uh, extremely inspirational and uh, yeah it's uh, every day is uh, a battle you pick yourself up you go you get ready uh you do uh you do your job and you come back and don't let it affect you mentally of course which is a practice which is a question of practice every day you have to practice practice it to the point where it becomes unconscious competence is that very in insightful i i find it very hard to not take the madam as a slide because when <laughs> someone says it it always feels like a slide um no definitely oh. especially when you know that they know you they they've just been speaking to you uh, or they speak to you thereafter uh, but as i said it's a question of practice if you know it's that old saying someone can throw mud at you but it's your choice whether it sticks or it doesn't stick yes absolutely uh maria coming to you sort of to ask you for your perspective um in from the pakistani perspective to ask you about your experiences and how you sort of deal with this uh whether in court and whether with the more obvious things or whether with the less obvious things and whether you feel that you've ever had to adapt your uniqueness as a woman to that of the men around you so i've uh, basically uh, started off my career as a clerk at the lahore high court so i was working for a sitting judge and uh, the sort of job was to uh sit through the court proceedings uh for the whole day and uh, observe the court proceedings and then be part of certain research queries given to you by the said judge um so yes i think there is that uh sense of uh, bias which prevails and it's best to uh, acknowledge it um and then sort of uh, make your own plan in terms of how to deal with it and i think a lot of that uh depends on the kind of personality that you have and uh the kind of sort of uh, sense of security that you have um so it may vary from person to person and i've also been practicing in one of the main cities of pakistan so in different cities it might be a lot more different um for me it was always that you have to come with a certain level of being prepared um so what will set you apart this is not only true for your appearances in court but also if you are practicing law in other areas in other fields would be that if you are prepared and if you know the subject matter um people are going to then not take you as oh this is just a female lawyer right because you can sort of speak to them you can uh, question them on substance so for example if you were just a law clerk like i was um i wouldn't have a lot of knowledge i was just out of my uh, masters degree i'd come back to pakistan what would you would know is this is the court room that i have to go to this is these are the list of cases that are going to be heard today uh these are the counsels that are going to appear if they do appear sometimes juniors appear so you have a context of where you're at um that's one and then as you progress because then i went on to practice and then i also worked in the government office the advocate general's office we were three women out of 100 of the advocate assistants and the additional advocate general this stays true uh because even then they will try to sort of uh, you know treat you as okay she's 
a woman, she's younger than us, you know, I just the kind of the uh, demographic was such, uh, but if you're good at what you do, uh, it will set you apart. And that requires you to do definitely more effort than the average man, uh, because they are not as, as competent in, in general, I don't think so. Uh, but they'll still be able to get away with it. Of course, you have to put in maybe, you know, that 20% more. Uh, but that's sort of the way that I dealt with it. Uh, the second thing is that as you grow um, as a lawyer, five years, 10 years into practice, there's a lot of your personality that develops. And you have to come across as a person who is confident. So even when people are sort of looking at your body language, they're going to think twice before approaching, before making a comment. Uh, and I've seen that when I see these very, very young women coming in, they don't know where the courtroom is. They look really long. When they sit, they're sitting with their sort of shoulders that are hunched. You know, they're all sort of together. And I think that is going to be a sort of, you know, an invitation for the people to come and be like, you know, oh, are you new? Uh, who are you with? To just start up a conversation, which at some time could just be an innocent conversation. But 80% of the time, it's not. Uh, at least in the context that, you know, I was operating in. Um, so from the get-go, you have to kind of have that sense of confidence. And there, I think, a lot depends on where you're coming from. So a lot of people may not have that privilege. You know, they may not have that sense. And that's something that has been addressed earlier. Um, the Honorable Justice had mentioned it. That is the role of mentors. So as young lawyers, when you're going, uh, you should have people to support you. I was very fortunate. I've always had mentors to support me. Um, so I know my sort of experience will be varied. Uh, but just to sort of sum up, I think your skill development needs to be there from the get-go level of preparedness. And you have to be conscious of the bias. And you have to be conscious of the way that you should be able to address it. So you should expect things like right now, um, Ankita was mentioning the madam issue. I had a different issue in the government office where they would keep saying, sir, to me. And I would be like, no, you know, in, in the, like the staff would just, because they're so used to just having men working. Um, so it varies, but you have to kind of point it out. Um, and I, I, it's worked for me. Uh, hopefully some of this would work for other people. That's that's very insightful and it's interesting because I feel the sort of experiences are so similar, you know, across the border. It's, it's so very similar. But Nandini, I wanted to ask you now your thoughts on this because you have a sort of different perspective uh, being in Calcutta, being um, sort of in a in a different city. So I wanted to understand from you how, how you sort of tackle this. And also, of course, being at a firm and being at a firm at like Khetan. Can you hear me? Okay. So, Ankita, I'll start by saying that uh, if you're doing litigation, whether you're in a firm or not, is not going to make that much of a difference because you are going to spend half of your day or more than half of your day in court. And I started off with Bombay High Court and uh, then I moved to Delhi, uh, to Calcutta, Calcutta High Court. And then, of course, Delhi is um, a regular feature. I'll tell you one thing, uh, let's, let's not discuss just the high courts. District court practice is a reality of the Indian and I think even uh, other countries. And that's where uh, we really need to see women more. Uh, the sanitation uh, issue in those courts are absolutely dismal. I have a funny anecdote on this, which I have repeated many times. It's there in the article that I wrote that I went to a district court a few hours away from the city and I was looking for a bathroom and uh, the men pointed out to a, uh, they were convinced that there's a bathroom in the building, but nobody knew where. Finally, the women pointed out to a, uh, like, a like a makeshift bathroom outside the court, but within the compound, thankfully. And uh, it was surrounded uh, by three tin doors and there was a bull standing outside, which I was told, Aki Raksha Karega. And there was a, a, you know, like a plastic sheet with holes for plenty uh, you know arrangement enough for women and when I wrote about it I was uh, in fact questioned that why have you highlighted this 
so uh, you know sanitation is uh, a, a huge issue for women working in district courts um and i think all of the unconscious biases that are there we will get to that whether it's the one ankita mentioned or the one maria mentioned all of those are there but i think the basics that we need to get right are first uh, issues like just pure like basics like sanitation um and you know these things will improve because uh, the the system wasn't geared to have women as there's influx of women the infrastructure will expand and will improve to accommodate all of the people coming in now with uh, so many uh, you know with consciousness and awareness about transgenders and non binary and third genders i'm seeing law firms and uh, corporate offices have a third gender bathroom a neutral bathroom so you know these are conversations that will come in our indian penal code which is the uh, one of the major uh, codes for india uh, it starts off by saying it defines gender and says that the the the, the pronoun he will you know be good enough for he and she throughout the code i mean there's an inbuilt bias that we are starting off with so you know it's going to take time but the good thing is that we are at a point that we are turning the corner where we are having conversations like this and uh, i think things will only get better with the time and uh, uh, you know in calcutta high court i'm very happy to say one of the judges commissioned a uh, survey of the bathrooms across the three buildings which uh, you know i was i did with one of my colleagues and we went to each of the buildings to see how the women's bathroom were functioning whether they were functioning whether they was you know in a hygienic condition and all of that we submitted the report and you know it's a good thing that uh, the high court took to cognizance of it and then improved the standards so you know these things are happening and um, i think we are just on the road up to it thank you so much nandini that was really insightful and you know these i think seemingly like maybe to a lot of folks things like sanitary issues and all they they seem like small whereas it's just a bathroom what what's the importance of that but um like you've highlighted i mean it's these things you start from these basic infrastructural issues and then it sort of like builds and then it sort of seeps into uh you know a bigger context um and and sort of people learn from that and understand that oh no like women also uh, need um a space uh so it's not only claiming physical space but then beyond that as well um so thank you so much for that insight and uh mehish i'd just like to sort of um direct this question to you but with a different nuance so i know like we've talked about how this is important in terms of courts uh so uh, you know the lack of infrastructure and how women have sort of tried to uh you know break those glass ceilings so from your perspective as executive vice president at you know hpl microfinance and uh, you know being the youngest member of the senior management and you know the added fact of being a woman so i'd like your boardroom perspective on this as well thank you i think uh, a lot of points that were touched you, you can actually use them outside of the courtroom which is how women are perceived uh and that i think is the starting point and i think that is something common between india and pakistan sort of the cultural perspective that carries through into your legal profession and in any profession not necessarily legal is to how a woman is perceived and what her role is perceived and how she has to make space for herself i think that really is the core difference between a man in any profession and a woman in any profession that men generally tend to have a space and women need to make space and so all the conversation we're having is about what a woman can do to ensure that that space is made or given or respected or set and i think like as ankita said and i really liked the way she used that word disability your own you yourself alone entirely on your own can assume that your gender is a disability and that assumption is self driven but it is prompted by external factors so i think the first thing that you know if, uh, if, if you uh, because i did start of my career in a law firm and i did go through you know the courts and then a corporate practice and then i moved in house my in house experience is only 6 years old but prior to i was in the more traditional sort of system of law uh, the experience really is that you have as a woman uh, have to be informed in a way that when you go in any workspace and particularly law 
your expectations should be realistic. You should expect that you will have to put an extra effort. You will have to be uh, more sort of um, out there. As Maria said, you have to give that 20% more. In some cases, you'll have to give, you know, more than that. You'll have to uh, demonstrate that your family life or your uh, personal life or your marital status is not going to affect the quality of your work or the amount of time you're willing to put in or the amount of effort you're willing to put in. Um, so there is that. And I think, again, um, you know, as um, even Nandini said, that uh, you point out these things, you know, something as simple as a sanitary issue uh, to more sort of nuanced things, uh, such as when women are speaking, men should allow women to complete their thought and not to assume that they know where women are coming from. And I think that is very important. And previously we heard, uh, you know, uh, the justice say that it brings women um, on an equal platform and allows the voice to be heard from an equal platform. And I think that level of equality is something that you come at eventually. We are certainly moving in the right direction organizations i believe slightly better placed because you know uh, the court system really is is sort of like a direct reflection not just of the culture but also of uh, government our laws where we are and they're very much um, sort of driven through um, the government uh, bureaucracy organizations are private sector places and so this conversation of diversity and inclusion and equity that is doing the rounds globally and also in the Indian subcontinent have really brought about a very positive change, I believe, in the last few years to bring in more women in the workplace. And now these conversations are, you know, sort of front and center from sanit uh, sanitary, you know, sort of uh, hygiene conditions to work conditions. So like Nandini said, one of the conversations, for example, the HB Microfinance Bank has had for a very, very long time is to ensure that every single branch in our tier two, tier three cities have a dedicated bathroom for women, which are clean, inspected, ensured that there is that, you know, space for women where they don't feel the need that they need to share a bathroom with, say, a male colleague. At the same time, you know, you provide them transport facilities to ensure that you have an equal number of women in the workspace. You may not be able to, uh, you know, sort of uh, expect the women have the same mobility in tier two, tier three cities as they would in the city, the main city, uh, you know, uh, sort of like the cosmopolitan cities. So you provide them that facility. And also then the understanding that there is a cultural um, expectation of women in Pakistan and India, where they are seen as primary caregivers. So to be able to cater to that need of women, and while I do believe that men and women should be equal caregivers, and, uh, you know, the conversation is moving in that direction. But while it is moving, we need to ensure that we remain um, cognizant of that current expectation in society and be able to offer, say, flexible hours, uh, better working conditions, and even work from home, remote work opportunities to women. So that's what organizations are doing. And that is, you know, something that has evolved over time. But absolutely, I will agree with what Maria and Ankita said that, you know, that bias is there you work with it you consider yourself not to be at a disability and then you work towards identifying those issues at as Nandini said and then you know that's where you start uh, going in the right direction when you have all these three things down then it's only uphill from here hopefully thanks Mavish that was super insightful I think what you said about making space um, made a lot of sense that you might not have the space but you've got to go and make it uh, to share a very short anecdote um, I was in court for a matter and it was a very heavy matter uh, lots of senior counsels appearing as expected not a single woman counsel appearing besides myself uh, and I was sort of the most junior of the lot, so quite bottom of the rank there. Um, and I had found a sort of couple of good cases, which the most senior of the senior counsels had approved and had cited and everything. And um, despite that, I didn't have a chair to sit because there were just so many counsels. And after he argued those cases, he turned around and asked who found those cases. Uh, and so someone pointed at me and um, he looked at me and he's like, you found the cases, but you're not sitting down. I, I said, you know, there's no chair and it seems like everything is occupied. So it's fine. And he told me that if there's not going to be a chair for you at the table, but if you bring the chair, no one's not going to let you sit. But if you don't bring the chair, you will always be standing. So just bring your chair and sit down. You have to make that space for yourself. And I think that makes perfect sense with what you said. 
Um, no, why is it for women? You bring your own chair if there's not a bring chair. Bring your own chair, yes. <laughs> but to be fair, in the Indian subcontinent, I think we have to give it to men. Uh, there is still a certain amount of chivalry that we may also ask for a chair and it be offered to us. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I, uh, that last point, my wish, I, I, I agree with that completely. Um, so, and uh, thanks for sharing that anecdote, uh, Mithi. Um, so I think moving on to the next question, um, um, and I'd like to, I'd like to ask, uh, invite Maria to speak first, and then, you know, we can uh, hear thoughts from other panelists as well. So, I mean, traditionally, <clears throat> laws, you know, of course, like many of these being inheritances of British India, so they were not gender equal or gender neutral. And, you know, we have you we have words that are clearly misogynistic or different provisions for women when it comes to inheritance, criminal laws, etc. So um, do you think laws are becoming more gender centric? And as lawyers, we'll also like to know how we can contribute to the change in gender centric laws. And and I just like to point out, Maria, like why I'm inviting you to speak. And I'd like to hear your thoughts is because. Um, I know that you filed a constitution petition challenging the, you know, archaic practice uh, of virginity testing in sexual assault cases, and that was accepted by the Lahore High Court. Um, and that is that is tremendous. And I think it's sort of in that light that we'd like to hear your thoughts on this first. Thank you, Jan. Um, yes, so I think to answer your question, let's begin with uh, one of those areas of law that we. Uh, really focused on when we're challenging the practice of virginity testing, which is to test if a uh, victim of sexual assault, a female victim, is a virgin or not. And uh, just by way of background, uh, the idea is that if through that test it's proven that she is not a virgin, then that affects her testimony um, or credibility in terms of her claim uh, that I have been assaulted. Um, and uh, interestingly, when we were working on the petition, uh, we drew a lot of uh, inspiration and materials from India, because in India, this practice is, had already been uh, struck down as unconstitutional. And a lot of uh, substantive work had been done. There was a law commission that was formed in India. And we realized that, you know, just across the border, this was a practice that was still going on. And the basis for this practice was uh, the colonial laws, the colonial sort of uh, principles that they were there, the practices were there, which is why it affected women both in India and in Pakistan. Um, so that was sort of this unifying thing where this colonial heritage was having this uh, really adverse impact on women, um, especially women who had been victims of sexual assault. Um, well, in that process that we did file the petition, uh, we looked at our criminal laws and we looked at the evolution of the criminal laws. And we saw that over time, the criminal laws were, uh, they were, initially uh, not something that would be helpful for women. For example, in our criminal laws, there was one of the sections which had said that, you know, you would assess what the character of the woman is going to be. And that's going to have an impact on the testimony of the victim. Um, and then that got amended. And there were other amendments in those laws uh, that made it easier for women to bring a case to the court. Um, however, one amendment or one sort of change that didn't happen was that this particular test prevailed on the books as a standard operating procedure. And what would happen would be that if there's a victim of sexual assault, she would have to undergo this test. And if this test showed that she's not a virgin, uh, then her case is sort of out of the window. And if she doesn't go through this test, if she refuses, then there is an adverse inference drawn against her. And it was only in 2021, so the judgment, the case was filed in 2020, and 2021 that uh, the Lahore High Court actually struck down this practice. So I'm just talking, what, less than two years ago that this had happened. Um, and so this will sort of give you an idea of, yes, there has been progress, uh, but there are still areas that need to be explored 
uh, where we need really massive, substantial changes in the law. Um, there's another part which is subsequent to this, which is talking about when you mentioned inheritance laws. Um, and then we now have laws which talk about the right of women to own property. Um, and that's changing, you know, because in our country, the inheritance law are related to what the sort of um, religious basis is. So it's it's a difficult area to navigate, but there's been progress on that also. Uh, this is, I'm talking about laws which are not becoming gender neutral. Uh, they're gearing towards the protection of women. Um, very recently, uh, I was part of a case where we were able to seek the enforcement of a law for protection of women against violence. Um, the law was on the books uh, since four to five years, but it wasn't being enforced. Um, so women who were victims of domestic violence uh, could not actually petition the courts in the way that the law envisaged. Um, so there's, you know, there's criminal laws, there's these uh, women protection laws, you have harassment laws, which other participants can speak about. Um, and your question, the second part of your question, which I understood would be, how could we as lawyers contribute to the change? And uh, I think one of the ways that the lawyers can contribute to the change is to actually make this a project, to focus on laws and see how can laws become more gender specific in terms of protecting women, then taking it a step forward, becoming gender neutral. I've not touched upon the fact that you will have many people who will identify with different genders, not the gender, not the sex that they've been assigned to at birth. Um, so it's a it's a long process and it requires a study of the legislation as it exists on the books, and then seeing what is it that the legislation lacks, what is it that it uh, sort of offends against the fundamental rights, the constitutional principles. And then being part of that change, A, as petitioning the courts, writing about it. And thirdly, I think uh, lawyers contribute a lot to the legislative policy making. So being part of those initiatives, being part of those committees. Um, so yeah, those are sort of my brief thoughts on the question. Thanks, Maria. That's really helpful because I think many times there there are there are people and you know so many of us who want to bring about that change, but very often it's not easy to identify this first step towards it. I think that's what most of us really struggle with. Um, coming to the Indian perspective on this slightly, uh, both Nandini and Ankita, whichever one of you really wants to talk about this should go next. But something that I think we should share with everyone is that very recently, the Supreme Court of India under the aegis of our uh, amazing Chief Justice of India, Justice Dhananjay Chandrachud, issued a handbook. Essentially, what that handbook did for those who don't Nandini has it right there, yeah. So for those who don't know what this handbook is about, it essentially listed a glossary of words that were being used either in a way that didn't recognize the rights of the community of, of women, the LGBTQ plus community, or those identifying as women that sort of were not progressive at all. And this included words that were used in orders by different judges from the district court to the Supreme Court, words that were used by lawyers in pleadings, and words that are casually exchanged. Uh, very often, I think um, uh, Ankita will, will affirm this, is that very often orders have unmarried women. And so Justice Chandrachud said that there's nothing like an unmarried woman, you just call her a woman, that's it. Um, and similarly, things like, you know, um, loose character, extramarital affair, affair outside of marriage, illegitimate, these kind of words were sort of erased. Um, do you think, Nandini and Ankita, that this is uh, the first step in the right direction? Do you think that they, how do you see the practicality of this handbook? Because the handbook is amazing, but very often whether it translates is, is what the problem is. So what are your thoughts on this? I'll leave it to whichever one of you who wants to take this. Should I go ahead? Firstly, um, you know, uh, Maria remarked about women owning property. I think the first step is women not being treated as property. Uh, because we uh, we had a section in the Indian Penal Code which was, um, which treated where, 
adultery was struck down as a criminal offense but really the logic behind it was that a man uh, the, the man who had the affair with a married woman without the the nigans of the husband would be uh, punished in a criminal uh, with a criminal penalty and the woman was not punished and that was thought to be progressive but really the woman if her husband had the affair she could not take any action against her husband or the woman and uh, because it was thought that a woman can't have that agency she has no sexual agency because once she is married she is the she is handed over her sexual agency to her husband and so on and so forth so i think we've traversed a really long way from that uh, the handbook that uh, medley mentioned is absolutely i think uh, it's it's pivotal to the big change that we're going to see and you're turning the corner stone on Uh, I think Matthew, you mentioned the unwed. Uh, the thing, the best one was hormonal. There's actually, uh, you know, the, the 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 list talks about hormonal. It's it's not nothing to do with woman or man. It's just an emotion, and it 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 talks about stereotypes. There was a judgment uh, which spoke about a man beating a woman because she didn't wake up at six a.m. to give him tea, and uh, the judgment said. that well uh, you know a beautiful wife should be waking up at 6 am to give her husband a tea but that is no reason to beat her i mean this is the kind of uh, stereotyping that the courts still even though it came to the right conclusion it uh, it it held that unconscious bias and this handbook calls out on that and the glossary is of course very good and i want to just uh, also take a minute here to talk about um, a compendium which is right here that uh, we at khetan took out it's an LG, it's a compendium on the lgbtq rights and it also has a glossary which the madras high court took out uh, on the correct terminology because there are so many terms that we get wrong and it's very very important uh, from the community's perspective that we get correct and i must say that i was completely in shock as to how many terms that i used to get wrong on a daily basis and um the and uh, when i started working on this compendium here i was asked by many people who are foreign educated who come back and working in uh, top law firms and mncs that is this your way of coming out or are you from the community otherwise why would you work on this uh, compendium Uh, well, I got so sick and tired of saying I'm not from the community. I said I started saying yes, I'm from the community. It's called humanity. There's really no other uh, way to deal with it, right? So um, I think uh, the handbooks that we are now seeing, whether it's uh, from the Supreme Court or something on the LGBT, uh, it it is to promote awareness. And Maria, to your point of what men, uh, sorry, what lawyers can do. to help i think creating awareness of these issues is very very important uh, you know the handbooks talk about cases the one i mentioned where the woman was uh, sort of you know uh, chided in some way for not waking up early uh, in the lgbtq cases you know we don't even realize that there are and the courts in india are doing a phenomenal job i must commend i must say because um, they are the ones who've been at the forefront of recognizing these rights now uh, something like a birth certificate that we take very uh, that we take for granted somebody who was assigned the sex of a man at birth because he had um, the genitalia of men of a man uh, down the line wants to have a birth certificate which says a woman will not get it and they have to file a uh, you know some sort of a court application an application in court to get a direction on the registrar now these are not things that come to my mind because i never faced these issues right and uh, in rajasthan there was a transgender woman who wanted to apply for the job of a constable while she succeeded in all passing all the exams because it was for a woman there was a problem and the court held that this uh, it should be as per the gender that she identified and the qualifications do not really matter whether she is sex like when well, how she was assigned at the time of birth so that's how rajasthan got its first transgender constable so you know courts are really at the forefront of these things and that's where i say that you know it's top down effect if the courts which are setting the laws which people have to follow are setting down these uh, you know progressive thought processes are coming out with these glossaries which say that listen there is nothing for like a child prostitute it's a child who has been trafficked 
or um, there's nothing called an affair it's a relationship outside marriage or there's hormonal is not just men it's not just a woman's thing it's a it's a emotion that can be ascribed to anybody it even talks about something so granular as pink is not just for women i mean this is the chief justice of india talking about pink is not just for women so you know uh, i think these will have a huge impact i had a uh, um, uh, as an intern coming up to me the other day and uh, she asked me that uh, you know uh, can she come to the court and uh, you know whether she can appear and i said of course you can't appear currently because you know uh, you're not uh, qualified yet but once you do we'll take you to court and she said by hopefully by that time the courts will start uh, referring the you know the pronouns in the judgments as she and it and not just he and i was like well hopefully with the handbook coming in more and more judges will speak to that absolutely i i think we're on the right path is is what everything all the conversation that we're having i mean we are all acknowledging the issues but what i do see common across all four of your insights is that there is positivity we are on the right path there is a sort of a brighter future ahead with everyone you know sort of all the attendees all the people outside that we know and all of us sort of working towards it um so sort of on that note you know working towards more women in um leadership etc my next question i want to direct it mevish um i think your experiences you know you um being sort of where you are sort of being a leader not only a lawyer but also a leader on a day to day basis i think it would be sort of good to have your insights into it then after that i would love to get ankita's on the on a sort of ancillary aspect which i'll come to shortly but as justice nagaratna said you know women get into the profession but don't get up the pyramid sort of that looks the way it looks for women is that it's just disparate there are many women at the sort of bottom of the pyramid but there are very few being able to climb up and get up in time the middle sort of spear a lot of them are dropping out so mevish what do you think what is the role that we as women can play in shaping the next generation of legal professionals in shaping sort of gender diversity on a day to day in our workplaces and in other workplaces and how do you see institutions being able to help so first of all i think uh, we as women uh, what we can do to help is first of all uh, we can recognize and be mindful that women have a different set of challenges and i really like this um, anecdote that i well not an anecdote but a comic strip that i came across many years ago where there's a, a race track and men and women uh, and i'm sure everyone's seen it men and women are at the starting line for the same race track but for women there's uh, you know cloth hangers and ironing boards and washing machines and babies and stuff in the middle where they have to overcome those on the same track whereas the men's track is completely empty and it's you know sort of uh, primed for success so we need to be a aware and be mindful that women come with a different set of challenges at the same time i believe that young women entering the profession as i said earlier need to be realistic um and as said by justice um the justice earlier there needs to be patience but not complacence uh, so you can't be complacent i will add to that and say that while being patient you also have to be persistent and resilient i think the two words cannot be um sort of you know uh, emphasized enough that when women come in uh, they need to know and we as women and as people who have families and are part of a larger community and even within our social circle can constantly emphasize that women um should remember that they with persistence and resilience can reach very far i think women can sometimes and you know this happens more often uh, than it should are the worst enemies of women because we tend to not uplift women as much as men tend to encourage men but rather to remind women of their ancillary responsibilities now i personally am of the view that women do not need to be reminded that they have a set of responsibilities i think everyone does a great job including the woman herself of holding herself to a much higher standard and a much higher bar than she needs to and is a far more of a critic of their own self uh, than one should in in an ideal situation 
Uh, so I think, A, you know, society, and we are all members of that society, uh, B, as women, uh, as colleagues, as mentors, as seniors, we need to be mindful. And C, really, in our own individual capacity, we should be realistic. Uh, we should uh, be very well aware that uh, there will be small wins and then there will be some losses. And that's the same for men and women. But for the women, I feel that women and those uh, other women surrounding that particular woman should celebrate the small wins, uh, be resilient to the small losses, be mindful that this is going to be a long race. So, you know, something that I tell to a lot of my colleagues is that you need to be mindful that there is a larger goal at the end of the line and not to really let the small things get in your way. It is much easier said than done. Another thing I think that women can do, uh, you know, when you ask this question and women in leadership roles is they can call out biases. And I think over here, a sense of humor is extremely important and can be very, very useful because sometimes, you know, somebody's going to crack a joke and be like, so, you know, uh, what did you cook today? And, uh, you know, what's for dinner? And you're like, why don't you ask the question to all the other men in the room, what's for dinner today? What do you cook? What do you have for dinner? Why is this a question that is, you know, sort of meted out to women? And it's it might just be for the sake of conversation, but there is a certain bias. And I also really like, you know, that sometimes because we tend to focus a lot on women diversity in the workplace in Pakistan, in the State Bank of Pakistan, and individual organizations such as HBL, Microfinance Bank, have really, really worked very hard on bringing in diversity in the workplaces. So we have like an open sort of communication channel. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of mentorship. Uh, women and men can mentor other women and bring them up. And so, as you see, that they enter the profession, but they don't reach the top. And I think somewhere in the middle, there seems to be an understanding from those who are in leadership roles and sometimes from those who are now at, um, you know, sort of a turning point as to whether we can continue to be in the profession or do we now need to make our way out, that women can't have it all. I personally disagree with it. Women can have it all. They might get it later. There may be some uh, sort of, there might be a longer road uh, or they might have to compromise on some things. But women can have it all. And we need to have that mindset that men and women um, are equal and that, you know, that has to be in your head and that has to be in another's uh, sort of um, perception. You have to act, be your own advocate and your mentors will allow you to do that. They'll help you get there. And also mentors will guide you. They'll tell you that you can do this differently or you can do this better or you really are trying too hard. But another thing, you know, how can women stay in the profession? I think one thing that we don't talk about enough in the Indian subcontinent, that conversation has started, but I, I think we can have more of it, is uh, litigation is not the only thing in law. And a lot of time what happens is women enter the workspace as a lawyer and they're young and energetic and they're very sort of enthusiastic and they're like, we're going to go into litigation, but maybe five years down the road. That is not the life for them. So instead of calling it quits, they should be exploring other areas where without compromising on their legal education and their legal experience, they can now take a different path and take that path to success. Also, a lot of times I believe that women need to have that conversation in their families, not just in their workplaces. So yes, that workplace conversation is very important, but also in that family that now that I am at a different stage in my life, maybe I need more support, uh, more help, equal partnership from my spouse, a bigger village from my family and community to allow me to continue down this road so that I can reach a leadership role. It's okay to take a pause. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to come back. It's okay to change your road. But you need to be aware and you need to be mindful that quitting uh, will not necessarily get you uh, the social sort of pat on your shoulder that women seem to want, um, that recognition that you're a good mother or you're a good wife or you're a good caregiver, a good, you know, sort of uh, family woman. We seem to constantly want that that validation. I think we also need to, as women, recognize that really, you know, uh, when men are not being held to that standard, why is it that we're so okay with being held to that standard and compromising on our careers for that? And, you know, we can't make everyone happy. Let's be very honest. Men or women, none of the two, uh, and no other gender, really, nobody 
living but sometimes not even the dead are able to make everyone happy with you know what what has uh, transpired in their lives or is transpiring and we should stop holding that as sort of like the benchmark so when you say that you know what can we do to bring women and ensure that women go up to the top a a different mindset culturally b a different mindset as a women try to bring them up c as women be mindful that the road might be more difficult but you have to persevere and you have to be resilient it's not going to be easy men don't have it easy either i think you know we should also recognize that while we are talking primarily about women the legal profession is not easy for men either however it is more enabling in some ways than it is for women i will concede and i will recognize that but women um, you know really um, need to help women and need to ask for help from men because it has to be equal and you should have mentors and you should have uh, support uh, from men and women equally now what can organizations do i think a lot of organizations are already doing it and more are jumping on the bandwagon it is focusing on equity inclusion and diversity to see the economic value of having a woman join in the skill set that she brings the soft skills the eq uh, the multitasking really being there being mindful being vigilant uh, being a lot more in some cases thara in her work because she's always had to prove herself With, uh, you know organizations are becoming more cognizant of the economic value that women are bringing and i think in the indian subcontinent we have to be mindful that with the amazingly large population growth and the never ending sort of explosion of population that we're having on both sides of the borders it is not sustainable to have an economy that is led only by men it now has to be equal that's an economic need so with organizations are moving towards that mindset and they are bringing in flexi hours better working conditions equal pay uh, parity across the board and slowly and surely i think women are going to start moving towards that uh, leadership role they need to stick around if they drop out they will not be able to get there and we as women need to ensure that other women do not feel that they have to drop out to be able to fit you know that box that we have for the perfect woman uh, that is sold you know in a variety of ways across the border in which is what distinguishes us from the west in a lot of ways our advertisements our movies our dramas everything the discourse in in mainstream pakistan and india seems to continue to box women and i think what we can do all of us can do and particularly leaders can do is change the parameters and you know sort of open that box up for a different um understanding of what it means to be a woman a woman does not necessarily have to be a caregiver or at least not the primary caregiver it does not have to be the homemaker uh, so you know all of that really and i think we we've, we've spoken about various nuances linked with what womanhood is we need to bring in professionalism work career uh, ambition um and leadership and all these things that we associate with men and equate that to a woman as we move forward thank you mavish i think that was very 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 interesting i think you you've said so many things that i feel like everyone can take away so much from and i think just sort of piggybacking on what you spoke about you know um about how you constantly feel the need to get validation from outside i want to now sort of take the question to you ankita I know that you recently became um a mother recently as in a, a couple of years ago so um and I think that came at a time when your career was also is and was also extremely busy um you know si- around the time that you went independent from Mr Dwarkadas's chambers there were a couple of changes that happened at the same time how do you do it and when i say how do you do it is how do you one sort of find that balance for yourself what does that balance look like and two how do you stop yourself from getting that validation which as mevish very rightly said is is impossible is impossible to be perfect at it it's impossible to be a perfect lawyer it's impossible to be a perfect mother so how do you sort of how do you navigate these waters in that sense um i want to start by saying that uh, mevish made so many excellent points and uh, of course uh, i endorse and agree every single one of them about balance and perfection uh, i found uh, even before i had my son that especially in court practice and i'm sure that's true for other practice areas in different forums as well 
a lot of it is a state of mind that you can be blessed that you're born with it. You know, where some people are far calmer than other people, uh, more uh, ha happier with themselves, uh, not constantly giving themselves grief, uh, not buying into the rhetoric that is constantly playing outside in your head around you. And others are not, or, you know, you may be a more type A personality where all this is affecting you. As Mehvish said, you have to first and foremost understand that this is a game of perseverance. You have to stay at the crease and your endeavor has to be that you don't get out. Now, I'm not a cricket enthusiast, so if I'm getting some of the analogies wrong, uh, I do apologize. That being said, you also have to very quickly realize that if you keep giving yourself grief and if you constantly uh, are in a race where you are trying to find perfection in any area of life, you're going to get very tired very quickly. And that's just going to lead to one, one thing, crash and burn, and then sort of exit from the game. I also learned something from a lot of my male colleagues, uh, which I think is hugely helpful. Uh, and I think uh, more of us women should sort of imbibe that, is the ability to not care about other people's opinions and also having an extremely good opinion of yourself. <laughs> and I think that if we can imbibe maybe even 5% of that, it, it'll help us hugely in our mental process and the whole uh, uh, idea of navigating through these turbulent waters. Now, having said that, I'm not going to pretend that uh, becoming a new mother and navigating court practice uh, has been easy. For me, I was blessed that it was a one in a hundred year event which coincided with uh, my son's birth. And then we had two and a half years of working from home. For the first time in the history of legal system, courts went virtual. And we had the ability to do multiple matters sitting in our house while you know your baby is playing in front of you. And it, it absolutely changed life for me. But now that we're back in the physical world, at least for the past one and a half year, it has not been easy. The guilt is real and the uh, the balance is a daily exercise. On a daily basis, you have to find balance within yourself, between work and the time that you want to spend with your family. But one thing that I realized in the course of this one and a half, two years is that if you look at it as a long-term situation, if you look at as work, if you look at work or as practice as something that you're going to do till whatever, whether you decide to retire or you know till whatever age you decide, every day becomes less hectic, and the urgency in your mind to get everywhere, to be doing everything, becomes that much calmer. I mean. You know, I was listening to Indira Nui, you know, who said that for women, the biological clock and the work clock always, always conflict. And so, you know, that conflict is something that is a part of our existence, right? What you do, what does help me, and of course, it's a slow process of realization, uh, unless you're born with that Zen quality, is if you look at your work as something that you have that you're going to do for the rest of your life uh, or till you die, uh, decide to retire you realize that the first few years with your child are something that you can take more time to give to your child because that's not going to come back and they become independent so quickly right very soon they they don't have time for you and you have all the time in the world for work so if you are in your mind able to sort of balance that equation and if you find that you you can give yourself less grief because you're your own worst enemy. I find that I give myself more grief than anybody externally can give me. So if you if you can reduce that uh, sort of mental noise, that helps hugely. Of course, at a more practical level, not to be purely philosophical, a good support system uh, at your end. Now, whether that's, you know, uh, paid help, whether that's, family help is 
absolutely, absolutely imperative. And I'll tell you, it's imperative from two points of view. One, of course, at a practical level, it helps you to do the jobs which you otherwise would end up doing as a primary caregiver, right? So you can outsource all that. Secondly, it also mentally helps you in your weak moments to talk to people who will be your support system. Now, whether that's your husband, spouses, friends, uh, relatives, whoever, whoever is your support system. I find that I would not have survived in this profession for 16 years had I not had a very solid family support. And I don't mean financially. I just mean putting in place systems that will help you do what would otherwise have fallen on your head. Uh, and then, you know, it leaves you mentally free to spend quality time with your children. You know, my guy, Nak, uh, who's an incredible woman, told me, don't worry about spending 10 hours or 16 hours a day with your son. Worry about spending two good hours with him. So that, I mean, you know, you can only do that if you're not doing the grunge work, right? Uh, and so a support system is crucial. Like I said, behind every successful woman is a buy. Uh, so please get very, very good support systems, both emotionally and uh, logistically to help you. Uh, and yeah, you will, you will, finding a balance is an everyday exercise, right? It, it, you will, you will find it on some days, not find it on other days. As Mehvish said, persist, persevere and don't get out. Thank you so much, uh, Ankita. I think but you effectively you've touched upon and you know elaborated in a lot of detail the the good girl syndrome basically that you know I think uh, women um, and and young girls in the Indian subcontinent sort of face you know face uh, by internalizing cultural messages and just you know how to break out of that that's you know really important and uh, thank you, Mevish. You you touched upon the difference. Uh, between the East and the West uh, in uh, when you were just speaking right now. And I sort of want to build on that and uh, end with the final question for, for this discussion. Um, so it's it, it's about, you know, what, so all of, I know all of you, all of us actually, we've uh, studied, we've had the privilege of, you know, studying overseas, experience the East and the West. So sort of want to understand, you know, what you think, and I think I'll direct my question at at, at Nandini because um, of your exposure at Colombia and a firm like Tetan as well. So do you think the challenges faced by women um, in the Indian subcontinent like are are different? How different are they from the challenges faced in the West? Um, and in, in what way? And sort of related to that, I mean, that, that could be from a practical work, professional perspective as well, social perspective, but more specifically like legal education. Um, it's been sort of criticized for, you know, maybe not, not evolving uh, with the times. Uh, so comparing the legal training that you received overseas from, let's say, in a, a subcontinent context, um, how important is this for like women in law uh, and in changing perspectives for women in law? Uh, Nandini, you're on mute. Sorry, I think that's the most popular phrase that came out of COVID. Oh, during COVID, yes. Um, you know, going to Colombia and experiencing, so I was there for an LLM, so of course we had um, students from all over the world uh, coming for, um, you know, their legal studies there. And uh, we, we did study along with the JDs, the ones who do their basic uh, Juris Doctor. So it was not a separate LLM class. So we did um, the classes with along with the JDs. I think the basic difference uh, that I saw from India uh, in the West was that it was very, very, it was understood that they would move out of their homes as soon as they finished their education or maybe even while they were at it and they would you know start with their uh, i mean they would finish their education and then go on to a career and marriage was something that would happen as and when it would happen i think the indian subcontinent and definitely in india the the, the the conversation is still a lot about getting married in your 20s um, and then figuring out what you want to do uh, maybe a little later this may not be the situation as much in the cities anymore but it is definitely the case in the tier two, tier three, tier four cities where uh, women's education has become uh, 
fundamental. It's something that all uh, places are doing, even villages are now educating their women, their girls. But uh, careers are still, um, you know, something that is considered second to setting up a home. So I think, uh, uh, and we, the girls stay with their parents to a large extent till they are married. Uh, that's something that we didn't see in the, uh, I didn't see in the Western, um, uh, you know, diaspora as much. And uh, there was an expectation that they would go independent and live independently as soon as they hit 18 or 21 or 23, you know. And uh, so I think that kind of uh, was a bit of a, um, while it's not a difference in how you look at their education or their careers, it does make a difference on how, as to how seriously women start taking their careers from a very early age. Um, so I think, and that's why they are sort of at the forefront and making the CEOs and the CXOs and the CTOs uh, that much more in numbers now in the West than in India or the Indian subcontinent. But I think we are quickly matching up. Uh, Harvard, interestingly, in 2016 law school, I believe, had more women lawyers, uh, women students enrolling in the law school than uh, the men. And now the national law schools in India are also equaling or having a higher number of women in the law schools. So the numbers are changing. It's a, I mean, as I said, as more women come in, the infrastructure and all of those things will improve. You're just kind, kind of catching up to the curve. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that I noticed was that in the West, um, family law, divorce law, uh, you know, all of these kind of matters, there were equal number of men practicing as women. In India, I've seen... Uh, if there is a matrimonial matter, they'll think, is there a matrimonial lawyer who's a woman? Uh, you know, there are these small biases that we still come across. Uh, I still have women coming up to me and saying to me that we want to go to a, a lawyer, um, you know, who's a woman. Uh, and, you know, thinking that women lawyers will do this better. And it's, a, it's a reverse discrimination almost of that sort, that women are only going to do these kind of things. Um, if you see how India has fared in the corporate law area, uh, some of the best, uh, you know, practitioners are now the uh, women who are leading their fields, whether it's competition law, insurance law, these are all emerging fields. So you see women making it from day one. The old traditional uh, fields of litigation or corporate MA are still where women are now catching up. And of course, we'll you know, supersede at some point. But I think it's just about where we are on the curve, nothing more than that. Thank Why you. Me, I'd like to add to that. Uh, yes, one critical difference that I found in the West versus what is uh, prevalent in Pakistan, particularly, and I'm assuming India because we seem to have a lot of cultural commonality, is uh, it being okay for women to network and advocate for themselves. So in the West, it's a lot more sort of understood in, in built because as Nandini very rightly said, women need to start taking their careers a lot more seriously very early on in the West. They feel it is okay to network and they are enabled to network and there's like actual networking happening, not just formalized networking through universities and colleges, but also informal networking through social meet and greets. And also there is this very much a concept uh, in the West where women will advocate in their be their own sort of you know, I, I don't want to use this phrase, but I can't think of any other right now, or toot their own horn. It's a lot more acceptable in the West. Now, when we come to the East, there is that idea that there are lots of informal settings for men to network. You know, they can meet over a smoke break. They can hang out after work for drinks. They can meet at a cricket match and there'll be this, oh, you know, I need a job. Oh, really, I have a vacancy. Oh, I know somebody. Let me push your CV forward. Women tend to not have that space in, in the East but rather not the East, but the Indian subcontinent, I will I will take the liberty of saying, and not just Pakistan. So I think that is also a distinction between the West and the East, and the East really needs to, we in the Indian subcontinent really need to step up and say that women need formal networking opportunities, and it's okay to network, it's okay to be ambitious, it's okay to want to be at the top, you know, we somehow don't still seem to associate that why shouldn't women make a lot more money? Like, you know, you hear things like, uh, in Pakistan, this is very common, um, when women ask for a salary increment or when they're up for an increment or a promotion, there's this concept, all this extra money, they're going to buy a handbag. Oh, more money for shopping. Oh, more money for doing this. You would never assume that a man getting more money will mean he's going to get a net new pair of shoes, you know, uh, 
it, it just seems to be associated with women, that women are working because they want to work and men are working because they need to work. And I think that's also another very critical difference that, um, you know, sort of impedes women's success because women are a lot less confident asking for that increase, a lot less confident asking for that promotion. And there's also this concept of imposter syndrome where women feel that, yes, okay, that particular role, I may not be 100% qualified for it. So they won't be seeking it out. Men will be 40% qualified for it and say, I learned 60 on the job. A woman 60% qualified of it is going to focus on her 40% and be like, well, you know, maybe I need to upskill and then reapply. And then that opportunity is gone. So I think that is a critical difference uh, that I have found, uh, you know, when I worked and studied in the US um, and in uh, the UK. And then when I moved to Pakistan and I worked in Pakistan, that we tend to look at ourselves differently, but also, you know, networking, ambitious um, sort of talking about yourself is not as widely acceptable here. And also, I think uh, what we have started now doing differently in a law firm, at least in our law firm, we started doing this. And I see it across a lot of the boardrooms that we don't ask women when you're recruiting that, uh, are you married? Do you have children? You don't ask a man that question while you're recruiting. So why ask the woman? Because you, the question really is to uh, assess whether she can give time. So I think that's something that we stopped asking at the time of recruiting. And that's Lucky. really, I think, very, very important, small, but very significant uh, change that we are seeing across uh, law firms and corporate houses in India at least. Also in Pakistan, that's a very welcome change and you're right. It may sound small, but it's actually quite big. It's, it's critical, I feel. And, uh, you know, the minute you stop asking a woman what are her responsibilities, you, you assume that she can take care and she'll be here and do her job. So that, that really sets the mindset change properly. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah, I think that that really sort of shows us that the path ahead is is positive and is there is a lot of scope for change, but that change is happening slowly but steadily. Um, I know it's time and I don't want to keep everyone from the rest of their lovely Saturday evening and the rest of their weekend, especially all four of you. I know you all have worked very hard through the week and taken time on a Saturday evening and spend it with us to have this amazing conversation. So a huge thank you to all four of you for doing that and for taking the time out of, I know what are very, very hectic schedules because sometimes I would get someone's message early in the morning or late at night. And um, I had to speak to Ankita in the middle of her arbitration. And so I, and you know, I spent 30 minutes in the morning speaking to Mevish and I could sense that she was busy doing so many things. So thank you, Nandini. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Mevish. Thank you, Ankita, for taking the time out, for joining us for this amazing conversation. It's left me feeling so inspired and I'm sure all the attendees would agree. This occasion is so important. It marks the incredible progress that we as women have made over the last hundred years with those who were trailblazing ahead of us and leaving us to now trailblaze for the sort of the next generation of women and the next generation of progress that is to come. It demonstrates that the journey is still required to be traversed, but leaves us motivated to make that equality a reality for real now. And before I thank all the attendees for joining in, I want to thank uh, someone very special. I want to thank Zainab, who's the co-president of ANHW Pakistan, without whom this event would not have been possible. She was supposed to host it as well, but unfortunately, due to personal reasons, she couldn't make it. We've had so many late night calls and long voice notes between us, but her incredible support has made this event possible. And this was the first ever event between the India and Pakistan chapters. Can you imagine? Uh, but it's really paved the way for all that will come and, and the more we can do together because just this event has shown us that there's so many similarities and learnings that go across the border. And to all our attendees, Harvard alumni or, or, or not, and all the others who've joined on behalf of the ANHW chapters, India and Pakistan, Shayan, Zainab and myself, thank you so much for joining the discussion and taking time out. Thank you, everyone. everyone thank you so and much. And thank you, Maitli and Shayan for some wonderful moderation. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Maria. Maria. Thank, thank you, Nandini. Thanks, Ankita. Thanks, Mavish. Thank you, Sharon. Had a wonderful uh, evening with you all. Thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate you for taking out the time. Yes, thank you. Have a great time. Sorry, the match. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everyone's going back to now. <laughs> 
Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.